Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good, inshallah. And hopefully, we'll be having the people joining in soon. So, we'll be waiting for, inshallah, roughly 30 seconds for the people to join in. Uh, so, guys, please share the feed and let us know in the comment section, wherever, whichever channel you're seeing the show, that you're able to hear us loud and clear. So, please let us know, inshallah, and share the feed, inshallah. Today's show, you can say, is obviously very pivotal with regards to uh, the role of women and obviously more so uh, the concept of veils from an Islamic perspective. Uh, so today's show, mashallah, we have Ustaz Fatima Barakatullah from England and Sister Sumaya, inshallah, will be running the show today. Uh, I'll just be disappearing very soon, um, inshallah, and you'll see me towards the end uh, when we have the audience questions and answers. Uh, so please, guys, like I said, share the feed, and I will be off now, and I'll hand it over to Sister Sumaya, inshallah. Sister Sumaya, over to you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasooli al-kareem. Amma ba'ad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Sister Fatima, how are you today? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fine, alhamdulillah. It's a yeah. funny day today in London. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, you're very welcome today. And um I'll I'll have a brief introduction of yours. And so that and after that we'll have um a few question and answers. You can start from there. Okay, um okay. yes, yeah, um, mashallah. Um you have you have a Lamia degree from um from a Salam Institute, and uh, mashallah, you are still completing your master's degree, and uh, and you are um, mashallah author of a lot of um, articles, and you are author of books, uh, women in the Quran and Aisha the Truthful, and uh, you also have authored your groundbreaking first book Khadija, the mother of histories of great nation. And mashallah, you have written numerous articles in Muslim magazines. Allahumma barik. And um, you're also a director of Seeds of Change, the biggest Muslim women's conference in Europe, and Dawa trainer for I IRA. And um, mashallah, you've been awarded the uh, Icon Akua International Award for Young Women in Dawa and Community Service in column four. Mashallah, Allahumma barik. May Allah put barakah in all on your achievement and you have been in Dawa um, program since last 15 years, mashallah, and your programs are also available on Muslim Central. Such a beautiful achievement. How do you feel about it? Uh, Alhamdulillah. Some of, some of that is uh, basically the, the two books that you mentioned are books that I'm writing at the moment. Um, okay. <clears throat> but the book that I have is um, Khadija. It's called Khadija, Mother mm -hmm. of History's Greatest Name, uh, published by Learning Roots. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, alhamdulillah, I, I began studying in Al Azhar actually in Egypt. And then uh, I came back to London and uh, began studying at two institutes here Ibrahim College and uh, uh, Salam Institute. And I graduated from both of them, alhamdulillah. So oh, it's been a long journey. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, Allah put barakah in your knowledge and make make it beneficial for all of us. I mean. Okay. Um sister, I uh, will start. Yeah, barakallah. I uh, will start one of the questions well with the questions now. Um as um this is, is a very important topic for women. Um, can you please elaborate on the evidence mm -hmm. of wearing the veil and the niqab? And is the niqab compulsory or just mustahab? Okay, jazakallah khairan. <clears throat> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Uh, before I begin talking about this topic, I would like to first say salamu alaikum to all uh, the brothers and sisters out there, wherever you are, you know, I'm sure you're from all different countries and lands and places and 
isn't it amazing, alhamdulillah, that we're able to meet in this way uh, from places that are just completely thousands and thousands of miles apart, right? Alhamdulillah. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that before we talk and launch into any kind of discussion about hijab, niqab, and you know these types of things, the first most important thing for us to always remember and bear in mind is that alhamdulillah as Muslims, we believe that you know we have a creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he created us, he nourished us, he gave us everything that we have, he guided us, alhamdulillah, to Islam. And furthermore, he gave us commands and he prohibited us from certain things. And he made this life a test for us, yes? I think we always have to bear all of those things in mind before we talk about any particular command of Allah, we talk about any particular aspect of Islam, because uh, you can't take the context away from the rulings of Islam, you know. So our creator, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, he guided us through the Quran, he sent us the Quran through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he taught us not just about how to dress, but every area of life right in every area of life everything that we needed to know to live a good life he told us and what we have to bear in mind is that everything that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us with there's something good in it for us whether we can see the good or not and everything that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from there's something bad in it whether we can see it or not. So inshallah, with that background, or with that understanding, we want to go forward. So coming to the topic of hijab and niqab, we know that mm -hmm. uh, one of the areas that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded uh, human beings with is uh, the etiquette for dress, the etiquette for how to uh, appear in public, right and to uh, and the way we we are allowed to dress in front of different types of people so for the muslim woman alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the quran verses uh, telling us to cover in a certain way uh, when we go out in public when we're in front of men who are not our mahrams meaning mm. men who are not closely related to us uh, with certain relationships and I would say it's a type of uniform. I think that's the best way to really conceptualize it, you know? It's a type of uniform. It's not the type of clothes that you would wear all the time. It's not what you would wear at home or when you're relaxed, when you're with women only or when you're with your family. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom taught us as Muslim women, and he gave men as well, of course, guidelines for their dress. Uh, but for us, it's much more visible, I guess. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to dress a certain way uh, when we go in public. And it's a type of uniform. And the verses in the Quran, the main verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this is are in Surah Al-Nur and Surah Al-Ahzab. Right? In Surah mm -hmm. Al-Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا لِبْعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَائِهِنَّ أَوْ آبَاءِ بُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ أَبْنَاءِ بُعُولَتِهِنَّ أَوْ أَبْنَاءِ أو بني إخوانهن أو بني أخواتهن أو نسائهن أو ما ملكت أيمانهن أو التابعين غير أولي الإربة من الرجال أو الطفل الذين لم يظهروا على عورات النساء ولا يضربن بأرجلهن ليعلم ما يخفين من زينتهن وتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ This is in Surah Al-Nur, 
uh, ayah number 31. And then the meaning of this, let me translate it, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, to the Prophet sallam, and to the men, he says, and tell the believing women to lower their gazes. Okay, so before this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the men to lower their gazes to lower their gazes from looking at forbidden things and pro to protect their private parts from illegal acts and not to show off their zina, their adornment or their beauty, except that which is apparent, okay? And to draw their khumurihinna, which means uh, their khimars, which is something you wear mm. on your head, so to draw their head coverings all over their bodies, okay? Um, and uh, some of the scholars said this includes the face, and others said it means all over their bodies, their necks, uh, their ears, you know, all of this kind of area, and the front of their uh, chests as well. And not to reveal their zina, their, their adornment, except to their brothers or their brother's sons or their sister's sons or the or other Muslim women uh, or uh, their sisters in Islam or your voice is paused. The video is paused, I guess. From the sister. Yeah, well, can... um, yeah, I think there was a disturbance there, but that's okay. we can carry on, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a list of the type the people who a woman is allowed to show her beauty to. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we said the women or uh, female slaves and what their right hand possess, old male servants who lack vigor or small children who have no sense of these things. And then, and let them not stamp their feet so as to reveal what they hide of their jewelry and adornment. And all of you beg Allah to forgive you all, O believers, that you may be successful. And then in Surah uh, Al-Ahzab, um, ayah number 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaytani rajeem, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, Qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina, Yudinina alayhinna min jalabibihinna, Thalika adna an yu'arafna, Fala yu'zain, Wa kana allahu ghafoora rahima, That, O oh Prophet, Tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers, to draw their cloaks, or in, in the Arabic it is yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihinna, to draw their jalabib, okay, over themselves. Uh, that is better for them that they will be known, and recognized as believing women, and not be uh, harmed in any way. And Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. So these are the two key verses, I would say. Okay. Um, there are other people in the Quran that Allah addresses, especially the wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But in these verses, you know, Aisha um, radiallahu anha, she said that when these verses were revealed, when the verses, you know, draw their, uh, their uh, veils over their bosoms was revealed, that the women, um, they took some garment of theirs and they tore them and made them suitable for themselves and they covered themselves with it and she says they covered their faces with it so some of the scholars of islam they said that you know they interpreted uh, some of these verses to include the face so to cover everything the whole body when we go out uh, including the face and to leave the eyes you know um and others interpreted it to mean uh, everything except the faith and hands. And that's because of other ahadith and other evidences. Um, and so the main thing that we need to know as Muslim women is that covering of the face is an Islamic practice. 
you know, it's part of our uh, deen. Uh, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they covered their faces. We know that for a fact from various ahadith and also from uh, the fact that in the Quran Allah told them that they have an extra level of hijab that they must uh, adhere to. Um, so it is an Islamic practice. The scholars of Islam considered it to be at least mustahab, meaning something that is recommended and uh, rewarded and rewardable, inshallah, in terms of covering the face. Uh, but if we were to talk about what the minimum is, uh, that the, that the scholars uh, agree upon, that would be everything except the face and the hands. And uh, the clothing with which we cover should be something that's loose, mm -hmm. that's not see-through, uh, that, uh, you know, um, yeah, we said it's not tight, that it's not a dazzling display in and of itself, you know. It's not something that's going to uh, attract a lot of attention because of its colour or its style in and of itself. So as long as a person is within these guidelines, then inshallah, inshallah, although some scholars did say in times of fitna that, you know, um, uh, women should cover their faces and it becomes obligatory for them to do so. Um, if we talk about what the majority of scholars say today, I would say, you know, at least covering everything, it's right. everything is, what is obligatory uh, for the Muslim woman. And when we as Muslim women only hear these verses and we hear these, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord, our creator is the one who is telling us, you know, that draw your cloaks over and, and the translation or the explanation of Jalabib in this ayah is uh, outer garments that a person just covers everything with, you know, that's what, that's what it was at that time. So uh, it's like something that you would cover your normal clothes with, you know. Um, if when we look at these verses and we see the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us, I think we should see this as uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for us. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us because he wants to protect us um, and he knows what's good for us. And so uh, in that kind of uh, spirit, I would say, we take these verses and we listen and we obey, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So I hope that kind of answers your question. I know that my answer has been quite general, but that's because uh. I, think, I think we should focus on the most important thing. And that is, uh, you know, that what the, at least what the majority of scholars have said and what the minimum is that we want uh, women all over the world to do. Um, so, Sister, you said you used the word jalabib that was in the ayah. So, um, jalabib is an extra garment that you cover yourself with. Yeah, I mean, uh, jalabib, you could say that it's, some of the scholars said it's an outer garment that you, you a bit like, you know, an abaya that we know of today, mm -hmm. or something, a cloth that, you know, like a chadar, like, uh, that yeah. covers everything. Um, yeah. But obviously, uh, as time changes, and we know that uh, Islam, you know, it came for different places and different times and different cultures. So different cultures and different people have interpreted or uh, have acted upon these verses in different ways, slightly different ways. And there's some accommodation for that in Islam. So, you know, as long as uh, whatever the garment is that a person is wearing mm. outside, as long as it is loose, it's not see-through, uh, you know, it covers the shape of the body, it covers everything except the face and hand. And for those who believe that the face is also, uh, should also be covered, then including mm. the face, then inshallah, uh, it would come under the category of, of Jalabib, inshallah. Okay, it should be simple and not attractive as well. Sorry? It should be very simple and not, not attractive. As yes, well. so it should, should yeah. not be a hina in and of itself, you know. And that's one of the mm -hmm. things in our times that, you know, when you go to the shops now, if you want to buy a, some Islamic clothing, one thing you yeah. find is they're, it's almost like they put jewels on the clothing now, right? On the abayas. Yeah. And, the, and uh, shining so, things. Yeah. 
these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, to cover your jewels, right? Literally cover your jewels, your beautification, whatever you use for beautification, you should cover it. So you know, one of the things I say to sisters is, all, all sisters should have a niqab in their wardrobe somewhere. <laughs> and the reason for that is, you know, we as women, at some times we might go out, we, we might want to wear makeup, we beautify our faces, you know, when we're going mm. to a wedding, when we're going to a party, whatever. And yeah. in that in that situation, when we have beautified ourselves mm. in that way, uh, then yeah. we should we should cover the face. You know, we should cover mm. our face because we've obviously added an extra level of beautification, right? So yeah. it would only be right for us to cover our face in that situation. Um, and of course, it will be mustahab. So the more we mm. do that. Insha'Allah, mm. uh, the right intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will reward us for that. Insha'Allah. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's excellent. Like if someone is having extra makeup and going to the party, so, and then they don't do the niqab. So at that time, at least when they're going out, don't show their beauty to the other person who is not mahram and have your niqab on. Yeah, yeah because what you mean to say, right? what's happened is people think, People nowadays think you either have to be a niqabi or non niqabi. You know, uh -huh. I think you have to like make a decision. You know, it's like your identity. Yeah. But yeah. I think instead of looking at it like that, we should think to ourselves. You know, okay, if you don't, if you don't hold the opinion that the face is obligatory to cover, and there's lots of evidence that it is not, then fine. But at least when you have, I don't know, you've worn lipstick, you know, what is the function of lipstick, if you think about it? The function of lipstick more beautiful. Yeah. is to make you more beautiful. It's, it's yeah. to bring redness, redness or a color to the lips and to the mm. face, you know, the rest of the makeup, the eye makeup, etc., to make your face look more dramatic, more beautiful. And, you yeah. know, you know that during, um, during intimacy, okay, naturally a woman's face becomes redder and her lips become redder so there is something there that a person is doing to beautify themselves that has a connection with being attractive to the opposite sex you know it, it's, mm. it's it's undeniable that that's what it is right mm. and so when we have yeah. done that and there's nothing wrong with wearing makeup there's nothing wrong with beautification mm. you know we should as Muslim women, we should take care of ourselves, we should take care of our clothes, we should wear nice clothes, we should beautify ourselves for our husband, for our, in our family settings. But when we're going out, okay, and other men who are not related to us are gonna are going to see us, then we should we should have a ghira for ourselves, you know. If you know this word word of ghira, or some people say ghira, the sense of protectiveness and jealousy for our own for our own dignity and for our own bodies, right? That no, yeah. other, no other man should be looking at us and feeling attracted or that our beauty should be for our families and for ourselves. So I would like us to move away from this feeling that I either have to decide if I am a niqabi or not, you know? <laughs> Instead of that, we should, uh, we should choose the path of more modesty, you know? And especially mm. when we have beautified ourselves, we should cover that. Even if we don't normally wear, you know, a face mm. Tomorrow, inshallah, is Eid, hopefully, inshallah. So. And a lot of us, of course, we, we're going to go out to the masajid from, for those countries where there's the masajid that open. And, uh, you know, they're going to, people are going to go out for the Eid Salah. But I would implore my sisters that, yes, you should wear smart clothing you should wear clothing that is clean and ironed etc but there's a difference between the indoor clothing right the private space and the public space there needs to be a difference between the clothing we wear in public and the clothing we wear in private and unfortunately what's happened is that has become a little bit mixed up now people are trying to turn the hijab itself into a beautification, right? 
uh, turning mm. it into a kind of accessory. Um, and that takes away the true meaning of the hijab, right? So I implore my sister, <laughs> my sister when we go out for a year, you know, definitely when you're with your families, when you're with your men, uh, your, your mahrams and your family and children and women, of course, dress as you wish. But when it comes to uh, being out in public, when you go to the mm. masjid, etc., you know, you should make sure that you're covered properly and that your beautification is hidden. It's not something that is on display. Hmm. Yeah, um, I can understand what you said. You won't, You said that like uh, we should be very modest and uh, very simple so that we are not attracting the opposite gender. And um, uh, and as you said, like, you know, our Muslim sisters have got beautiful um, and different styles of uh, abayas and scarves, and sometimes they are very attractive, especially mm -hmm. when they have, like, dazzling pearls on it, especially, yeah. Exactly. So, in other words, yeah. we've uh, taken the jewels that we would wear inside and we put them on the outside. <laughs> so, it yeah. kind of defeats the purpose, you know, of the outer garment. The outer garment is supposed to conceal the jewels. As we can yeah, see in this ayah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, do not stamp your feet, right? Uh -huh. Because they used to wear, you know, they used to wear anklets on their feet, you know, like uh, these, uh, I don't know what you call them in Urdu, but uh, you know these, these things that you put on your, these, uh, a bit like a bracelet, but for your anklets, oh, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they used to wear so anklets. That would make some sound. Some, sometimes it has little bells on it or something. Yeah. And so yeah. Allah is saying in this ayah of the Quran, don't stamp your feet in such a way that people can know okay. what, what you are all dressed up. You know? SubhanAllah. Yeah, so that's so right. you can see that the whole spirit of the hijab is that when it comes to our normal beautification, our jewelry, our, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not stop us from doing that, but he just mm. says, to cover that when we're going out and when the presence of non-mahrams. Okay. Okay. And uh, sister, so we've got like a few um like the terms that is used as hijab and then there's a niqab, then khimar. Like we'll have a brief uh, description of that and then we'll move on to the next question. Can you just let us know the like hijab? In in modern in time, in modern yeah. time people say hijab. Uh, I don't know what, what it's like in the East, but definitely in the West, when we say hijab, we talk about the Muslim woman's dress. It can mean anything, you know, actually. It can mean anything to do with the Muslim woman's dress. It can be either a scarf or something like this. This is how people in common language use use the word hijab nowadays, right? So if you were to go to a, like a shop, you want a hijab, they would show you all of the scarves, basically, right? Okay. Um, in the Quran, though, the hijab is usually used for some kind of a curtain or a barrier. Yeah, a curtain or a barrier. So right. the, wives, the wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were told that whenever somebody wants to speak to them, they have to speak to them from behind a hijab, meaning behind a curtain, right? Because they had an extra level of um, hijab that they would have to adhere to. Uh, so that's what the word hijab means, what it meant, okay. and then what it means in, in modern times. Niqab, people usually use to mean a face veil, right? Something that covers the face. Mm. And yeah. khimar is, um, is a word that is in the Quran, or khumar, the plural of it. And it just means a head covering. So yeah. whatever you wear on your head. Yeah? Hmm. Okay. So khimar is the head covering. All right. Um, okay. Uh, next question is: Having a joint family system, it becomes difficult to follow the commands of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala with regards to the veil. So, can you please provide examples in various circumstances what is allowed and what is not allowed? Especially in warmer climates, it is very, very difficult for for women to wear a veil, like uh, cover her face, nip up, yeah. When you say to wear the veil, do you mean to cover the face as well or just? Yeah, yeah. Cover the face, yeah. Okay. 
Um, to be honest, I would say that if a woman really wants to have the baby, then yeah, no, she's made the decision, and so uh, if she wants to do it all the time in front of non-mahrams, then as you can tell, I personally do not consider the niqab to be obligatory, right? Um, from my research, I don't consider it to be obligatory, and so um, it's difficult for me to answer that question, to be honest. Uh, but if a sister is going to wear the face veil, in even you know with all the non-mahrams around her then I would say that she has to talk to her husband, to her husband. the type of environment uh, which uh, can be conducive to living like that, right? So, uh, of right. course, yeah, um, as a Muslim woman, you know, Muslim woman has a right to have at least her own space, her own room, right? If, yeah. if she has to live with others. Um, mm. And so, hopefully, she can have enough space for her to have a little bit of you know uh, but if it's proving to be too difficult and if she doesn't consider the niqab to be obligatory then I would not personally ask her to put herself in that very difficult um, mm. situation you know um, I would say definitely maintain the hijab maintain all of the you know, uh, you know and don't beautify your face etc in front of the mm. non mahram <clears throat> Definitely do not um, be loose in speech, you know, where you're, of course, you should be polite with your family members, yeah. you know, whoever they are, but there's mm -hmm. no need to kind of sit, chit, do chit chat and that kind of thing. Maintain, Keep the, a certain the, distance. maintain a formal relationship. Yeah. Yeah, maintain a formal relationship um, and find ways. I think this is the thing as Muslims, mm. you know, even like, Tomorrow, for example, is right, mm. and I'm going to have my family round to my house. Now, I I would say that Muslims, especially in Muslim countries, they should, and I would say I would encourage them to try to uh, design the houses in such a way that will be conducive to men and women being able to sit separately. For example, you know, um, and right. I know that I start easy. I know it's not easy for everyone, okay? Yeah. And I know that not everyone has that kind of space and that kind of luxury, I would mm. say, to be able to do that um, mm. perfectly, <laughs> comfortably. But That's you know, right. as believers, we do our best. I think you can't, ask, you can't ask a person to do more than to do their best. That's what is right. wrong is when people think, oh, let's just forget about all these rules. Let's just leave all these rules. It's too difficult. And yeah. then see that the sisters are not wearing hijab in front mm. of their um, non-mahram non men, you know. Right. Yes. So that that yeah. is where it would become wrong. So what we do mm. is we do our best. We do we do our very best. Yeah. And we maintain at least the minimum rules, which are Distance. to cover everything but the face and hands, and okay. um, to maintain the correct adab and the correct uh, etiquette. Okay. Yeah, you know, what, what happens is that like the veil changes the culture of the house. And uh, it's um it's considered a physical barrier between you and your non mahrams. And being in this setting, uh, it's very difficult to make a positive influence. So how can you make a positive influence? Because it is considered a showstopper um in communication. Okay. Um to be honest. I think this is just a perception that people have, you know, uh, who might not be used to wearing the face veil. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. um, I would say that unless, you know, maybe uh, if if your if a woman's husband feels doesn't feel very strongly about it, if he does feel that she right. should wear a face veil, then of course she should just do her best. It's not her yeah. job to do that. Hour. It's not her job to do that hour to all the men of the house. You know, it's not her role for, to do that. Uh, that role yeah. is for the other men. Okay, uh, but if it is proving to be difficult, if it is something that <clears throat> they don't consider to be obligatory, then I would say, you know, it's not obligatory, and so 
yani you can make sure that the other aspects of hijab are maintained yeah um, and uh, that the formality is maintained i don't think that the veil in and of itself causes problems it's just mm. the way people perceive it perhaps that causes problems or people who are not used to it okay mm. so it's um it's the way anyone perceives it okay so uh, why do women who wear the veil come off as more judgmental of others so how do you advise what would you advise sisters about this so you mean women who wear the face veil yeah okay um again i don't think that that's true <laughs> you know um sometimes i think i think in all types of people there are harsh people and sometimes there are you know more compassionate people um, maybe mm. some people have had some bad experiences uh, of course none of us as believers should be looking down on anyone else you know but sometimes i think people feel uh, that somebody's being judgmental because they actually feel guilty themselves you know sometimes if they're not obeying allah and they're not doing uh, the right thing and they have some sense of guilt then when they see women or they see people who are doing that thing they feel judged by them you know but actually you know most people are just getting on with their lives i think they're just trying to practice islam practice their deen themselves um but of course i would say that um wearing the hijab wearing the niqab this doesn't automatically make a person you know exonerate them from any other sins you know we mm -hmm. all of us yani, the, uh, we should all obey allah but there could be people who don't wear the hijab who are struggling maybe they have it they're on a journey they're they're trying maybe they might have better characteristics in other ways right however we can't take away from the fact that uh wearing the hijab is uh, a command from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um and so of course it's best it's it's the thing that women should be doing um mm. so i i think uh when we're discussing this i feel like sometimes we're i'm not sure if you're talking about the face veil or you're talking about you know covering in general because i know that in many of our countries you know mm. women don't even wear the hijab right uh, yeah they've, they've lost that sense you know i'm not i'm sure mm. that in golf is it's maybe a bit more but i've lived in mm. places like egypt i know places like pakistan and even india muslims in india mm -hmm. you know there has been ge generally a, 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 i would say people have become quite lax about even the basics right so mm. i would say i would rather address the basics of the hijab rather than talk about the niqab you know mm. yeah and the basics contain a lot of things as you said like the modesty and maintaining a certain distance for the non mahram yeah, yeah. That's right. okay okay um as it just says like my husband uh, really wants me to wear the niqab but i find it very difficult so do i have to obey him or vice versa like i don't like the other, the other way around as well well uh you know one of the things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commanded us as muslim women with is to obey our husbands uh -huh. so if your husband is asking you to do something good he's asking you to do something and um it's not something that's going to harm you in other words you yeah. it's not going you know you're not going to be in some kind of medical harm or some kind of uh you know um problem inshallah yeah then of course you should obey him yeah because that is what pleases allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if a woman prays her five prayers and fasts her month and uh yeah. with her husband yeah and there's some uh -huh. other things two other things i've forgotten um uh, protects her chastity 
then it will be said yeah. to her that she can enter into Jannah from any of its doors, right? So obeying the husband is a part of our being. Okay? Uh, yeah. If he's asking you to do something that you find extremely difficult or you don't think you can do, or then it's a case of negotiating, you know? It's a case of negotiating. Yeah. Just as when we are living with our parents, our parents ask us to do something. If we don't want to do it, we would negotiate with them, you know? Yeah. And a woman yeah. can try and negotiate with her husband, you know, reason with him, uh, mm. find out what are the reasons why she wants to, she doesn't want to do it. You should express that. You know, mm. does she feel in danger? Does she have some medical issue or whatever? Um, but otherwise, uh, I would encourage uh, our sisters that, you know, um, to yeah. take care of our husband's considering is important. Yeah, okay. And if um, if a sister wants to have niqab and the husband just say, like, don't take it. So, um, so it's, it's the same thing as you said, like mutual understanding? Well, if she believes that it's obligatory, yeah. Um, then, you know, it means that she is convinced that it's obligatory and it's an obligation from Allah for her. Um, but anyway, in all situations, I would say, if there is some kind of tension or there's some kind of conflict, then we should always try to negotiate with the person who we're talking to, you know? We should try mm. to negotiate with our spouse, just as we would negotiate anything, right? Yeah. Rather than having fights or, um, you know, talking about what's my right and what's your right, rather than having that kind of relationship and that kind of conversation, better mm. to have a, uh, a mutually respectful conversation where you are able to express uh, each other, ex express yourself, um, and come to come to some kind of uh, agreement. Okay. All right. Um, so well, for marriage, I just want to add. Of course, if a husband yeah, is asking sure. his wife, if a husband is asking his wife <clears throat> to uncover what is considered to be aura, what is considered yeah. to be the obligatory, which I believe is everything but the face and hand, he's asking yeah. her to uncover that. If he's asking her to beautify herself in public, asking yeah. her to do anything like that, which is haram, then of course yeah. she should. She should not obey him in that. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, and also, like, uh, some sometime what happens is that, like, some women, they start practicing deen, and then they start covering, and the husbands are not ready. So in that case, a sister, like, should explain and, and should wait. Sometimes it happened. It happened in the past. Like a, a lot of sisters have faced this issue as well. The husbands are not ready, even for them to wear the hijab or like the basic covering of head. Mm, uh, yeah. You know, a lot of men, a lot of men have lost their sense of the They've lost that sense of protectiveness over their wife or over their women. <clears throat> And what happened is the opposite, that some men, they would actually like to flaunt that their wife is beautiful or that their wife is attractive in public. Okay. And this is, this is a major sin in Islam, you know. Yeah. To want your wife to uncover in public is a major sin. It's, it's, it's a category that Allah's, that the Prophet called the youth. The Afa is basically a men who... Uh, yeah, they, they use their women or they t encourage their women to appear in public in, in a certain way in an incorrect way mm. and yeah. so uh, so could, again you know there is no obedience to the creation in disobedience to Allah yeah? there's no obedience to the creation in disobedience to Allah so mm. you don't disobey Allah in order to obey the creation, right? So the yeah. sister, of course, with a lot of hikmah, with a lot of wisdom, 
all of us, you know, if if we're going mm. down a certain spiritual journey, we should be trying to take our families with us. You know, we should be trying to take our families with us with wisdom mm. and with kindness. So it shouldn't be that we are studying the being, we're studying so much and we're just developing ourselves. Mm. We should be sharing that with our families. We should be sitting, we should be sitting with our husbands and saying to them. What is our vision for our family? You know, what kind of family do we want to have? And together you formulate that vision and and so that you are both on the same page, you know. But if it so mm -hmm. happens that a husband is, um, is not there and the um. wife is, uh, is obeying Allah in the obligatory things and he isn't, then mm -hmm. she shouldn't disobey. You know, she should try her best to obey Allah and to convince her husband <coughs> and to bring him round. Mm. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. All right. For marriage proposals, what and how much is it allowed to see of a prospective candidate? Okay. Um, generally speaking, um, from my research, uh, you know, when you're going to see somebody for marriage, if a man is going to see a woman for marriage, yeah, then he can see her face and hands. You know, generally speaking, that's what he should he should be able to see her face and hands, and he's allowed to look at them as well. And of course, it's in the presence of um, any other people, right? It's not in private, um, and that's generally speaking the guidelines. If he wants uh, more of an idea of what she looks like, etc., he can ask a female relative. Uh, the scholars generally say, you know, he can ask a female relative to look at her and to mention to him, uh, if he's serious, and he, to mention to him what she looks like, etc., uh, without her hijab. Uh, but generally speaking, that is what the scholars are agreed on. Mm. Right, so it's only the face and the hands, as you said. Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, there are, there are uh -huh. he can actually look at her without hijab as well, you know. Um, but most of the fatawa that I've read, they tend to say, you know, just to be a bit on the safe side, they would say, uh, you know, the face and the hands are sufficient. Mm, okay. All right, um, so she's coming back to the niqab. The niqab has a, a very negative connotation in the East um, as a cloth that the people uh, in the lower classes, they wear. So how okay. we combat, how should we combat this thinking and approach? Uh, when you say the East, what do you mean? Like, um... like Pakistan, India, and yeah, in the subcontinent region. Do you feel that it's like that in the Arab countries as well? Uh, not necessarily, but in our in our country, sometimes the women who wear niqab, they are sometimes they are looked up, looked down upon. So you mean countries like Pakistan? Yeah, Pakistan, India. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Subhanallah. I would say you know. That's a shame. That's a real shame because, you know, countries like Pakistan were built for the sake of Islam, right? The whole foundation of Pakistan is the land of the, the pure people, right? The land of the Muslims. And mm. we know that the mothers of the believers, they wore the niqab, they covered their faces, and yeah. that it's a Muslim practice to wear the hijab. I know that even in places like Pakistan and India, unfortunately, uh, people have stopped wearing hijab even, right? You know, it's not, we're not just talking about the niqab here. Uh, even covering of the hair and covering the body has become yani, something that people are not doing. So I'll say mm. that this, to change this perception, we need to do more da'wah, we need to invite people and remind them of what the purpose and the point of being a Muslim is. It's to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that, you know, as Umar bin al-Khattab said, he said, we were a nation that Allah honored, he gave us izzah through Islam. Yeah. If we try to gain honor through any other mean, then we will be humiliated. Mm -hmm. We will be humiliated. So I'll say to my Pakistani and my Muslim sisters in the East, you know, what differentiates you from the Hindus? What mm. differentiates you from other people? You know, if it is your deen, if it is the fact that you believe in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. then part of, believing, part of believing in Allah is obeying Allah mm. and realizing right. that we as Muslims, our izza, our sense of honor comes from Islam. It does not mm. come from any other way of life. It does not come from following, you know, copying Bollywood or from copying any other culture. We have our own culture. Yeah. We should uh, own that, celebrate that. Mm. So I think we mm. need to increase the power in um, all different classes of people in society. Mm. And uh, inshallah, I'm noticing that more and more educated yeah. systems more mm. and more knowledge, the more people seek knowledge of Islam, the more yeah. they become committed to Allah. And mm. uh, inshallah, this perception is changing, it's definitely changing. Yeah. Okay. So what's the best way to advise our sisters uh, who, are, who are not wearing the hijab or the niqab? Like most of the sisters understand for it to be compulsory, but they find it difficult to wear, especially due to peer or extended family pressures. So what do you advise? I think the first thing is that, look, you know, when a person's iman is strong, when they get to yeah. a certain level of iman, then they don't care anymore what people think. Their care for what Allah thinks becomes stronger than their care for what other people think, right? So I think our focus always has to be in lifting the level of Iman of the people, you know? So it's not necessarily just preaching about the hijab, right? Yeah. It's about reminding people and reconnecting them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, we have this idea in Islam of a tadarruj, okay, oh. which means learning and seeking knowledge in degrees in, in order, in a certain order. So I would say the first thing is that a person needs, we need to encourage and increase the level of uh, literacy, mm. I would say, or education in our yeah. community with regards to uh, oh. our aqidah, right? Our, our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our iman. Yeah. And then yeah. also, uh, our connection to the Quran, the connection to the Quran, because okay. the more a person, the more a person is connected to Allah, connected to the Quran, yeah. and establishing the salah, is establishing, yeah. you know, uh, the five pillars, okay, which are the most important. Mm. The more a person does those obligatory things, the more they will be likely to mm. be able and want to obey Allah in other areas. So there's no point, I would say, or there's very little point in neglecting the salah, for example, which is a problem yeah. in our communities, right? I know that yeah. people, a lot of people don't pray. But we get very upset when we see a sister who's not wearing hijab. We don't get upset if she doesn't pray. You know, there's something wrong there. The salah is way more important than anything. That's right. right. That's so, part, yeah, yeah. So we have to make sure that we're focusing on the right thing and that we're doing tarbiyah, which is developing and nurturing and educating people in the right order. And that begins with our iman, our knowledge of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, our connection to Allah, and with the salah. Uh, and I think if mm. we focus on those things and we focus on reconnecting people with the Quran, then inshallah, the other aspects of Islam will follow. But in general, I would, I would reach out to my sisters and I would say to them, we need to create situations where it's easy to wear hijab, right? So I know how it feels. You know, when I was at school, I went to a school with non-Muslims. 
right? I was the only girl who was wearing hijab in my school. And people would make fun of me and people would uh, sometimes make jokes or say some racist things, you know? But generally speaking, me being present there, people respected me a lot. You know, generally speaking, people respected me. So over time, I gained their respect. Um, and I would say that I realized from my experiences at school that it's very important for us as believers to be around the sort of people who will make it easy for us to be Muslim, to be believers, to practice Islam, right? So if you have a circle of friends who, mm. who are making it hard for you to obey Allah, then are they really good friends? Are they really the sort of friends that you want to have? We have to ask mm. that, right? Because uh, mm. the Prophet وسلم, said that uh, a person is upon the religion of his companion or his brother, right? So That's we have right. to be careful who, who we accompany. So mm. as mothers, for example, we should make sure that our daughters uh, have good company, uh, that they go to uh, gatherings where they meet other girls, other women who are wearing hijab. I remember I met a, a sister many years later, and uh, she said to me, one day we were all sharing, you know, how did we start wearing hijab? And one mm. of the sisters, she said, uh, the reason why I started wearing hijab is because I saw uh, Fatima's family and Fatima's mother. And her okay. mother was always, was, used to wear hijab. And because of that, we copied them and we felt like it was good, you know? So sometimes it takes one person, it takes one family to take a stand and to do the right thing. And inshallah, people will come, come towards it. But I want to say one thing to all my sisters out there who are thinking, you know, I find it so hard to wear hijab or I want to wear it, et cetera, et cetera. I'll say to you, you know, my dear sisters, if you ever have seen a person when they've passed away, a sister who's passed away, mm -hmm. you'll see that on the day that that sister passes away and she's being buried, she will be put in hijab, you know? So my sister, mm -hmm. sooner or later, as Muslim women, you are going to wear a hijab. If you don't wear hijab during your lifetime, when you're buried in the ground, when people are putting the kafan on you, one part of the kafan is the hijab that they will put on you. Mm. I say to my sisters, don't allow, don't allow the only day that you wore hijab to be the day that you died. That's the right. The day that yeah. you're no longer on this earth. You know? So mm. I think it's really important for all of us to put that into perspective and realize that forget about mm. the hijab, forget about the, the, the ruling. Think mm. about who you're disobeying. Think about the mm. person who you're disobeying. Disobeying Allah, your creator, the one who gave you everything. SubhanAllah, mm. who gave you that beauty, right? Mm. Allah is the one who gives us that beauty. And then he told mm. us how we should use that beauty. So should we not obey him? Of course, we should obey him. Because the one who gave us our beauty, he can take it away. Mm. That's right. Yeah, you pretty much um, answered my next question. Was my next question was for the young girls um, mm -hmm. who do not want to cover the chest or want to wear the loose clothing. And a lot of girls wear very tight clothing. Even the abayas are very skin tight. Mm -hmm. So I guess like you have pretty much covered the answer. Yeah. Would you would you like I to add something or should I move on? Yeah, I'd like to say that we need to bring our daughters up from a young age to have a sense of hair. Yeah. You know? If up to uh, quite an old age you're you're getting you're allowing them look, hmm. the thing is that haya is something that has to be nurtured, right? Yes, human beings hmm. are born with a natural sense of haya, but it yeah. has to be protected and nurtured. You know, if you go yeah. to the gym, if you go to the gym in the UK, okay, yeah. and you go to the changing rooms, uh, women in the women's changing rooms, nobody will care to walk around completely naked. Uh, I'm not joking, okay. 
because it's normal for them. Because for them, that's, there's nothing immodest about women being naked in front of other women. So sometimes when I've seen that, I think to myself, how did it get to the situation where mm -hmm. some women think there's nothing wrong with this and we, yeah. would, never, we would never even dream of it. <laughs> like we would never even dream yeah. of walking around like that in front of another woman. Forget about yeah. in front of and the mm. reason the reason for it is because yeah. the sense of hayat has to be nurtured. Whatever Strong. becomes normal, whatever becomes yeah. normal, this is what we think is hayat. This is what we think is uh. modest, right? So uh, yeah. because, because we as uh, Muslim women from a young age, mm. our parents taught us that you know, knock on the door before you come in. When you're going to change your clothes, go pri be private. Even yeah. in front of your father, you know, when you ask a certain mm. age, you cover a certain way, etc., etc. Because of all these adab, all the adab of Islam, it mm. nurtures in us a sense of haya. So <coughs> we can police ourselves. We don't need somebody else to police. So mm. I think it's very important for us as parents to nurture the sense of haya. It's not something you should suddenly, you, you can't suddenly put it on somebody. They have to have it from a young age, you know. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Ustaz of Fatma and Ms. Maya. I think it has been a very kind of uh, very heartwarming session, inshallah, for the sisters. And Jazakallah Khair for clarifying a, a lot of points, I'm sure, which have the challenges in the world. Inshallah, we'll be starting the audience q &A now. Uh, there are quite a few questions. I will try to take only those questions which actually have not been discussed already in the show. So whosoever has just joined late, I would request them to please go in the beginning and re-watch the show later because your question would have been answered uh, in some part of the show. So I'm just going to be sharing those questions which have not been discussed so far. So, Ustaz Fatima, the first question is that uh, you can see it on the screen now. How does one cover an exercise in public? Okay. So, uh, well, look, the thing is that, uh, well, I'll tell you what I do. I just wear a very loose abaya, loose hijab, you know, loose clothing, you know, just what I would normally wear. And I would go walking. The main type of exercise that you could do in public was walking, I think, you know. Um, and of course, there's nothing wrong with walking in public. Um, other forms of exercise, I would say, you know, we need to create spaces where sisters can can do these things and in a conducive space. Even though we live in London, believe it or not, there are women's only gyms here, you know? Yeah. There, are women, there are women's only swimming times, alhamdulillah. Um, and that didn't just come out of nowhere. It's usually because Jewish women and Muslim women requested that, you know? And because they asked that, no, we want this, we want this. And the men supported them and they, or well, they built Swimming, you know, etc. So, in, your, in my local area, for example, we have a Jewish uh, run gym. And even though the people who run the gym, they're not religious, they care about the women in their community, right? So, they created women only times, they created um, uh, women's only gym space. So, <coughs> Important for us in you know in our communities to create those spaces. Uh, it's not impossible, especially in Muslim countries. I, I can't understand why those facilities would not be I, there. I what's happening is that even the facilities which are there in the Muslim countries, for example, I can give you a number of examples in the Middle East and subcontinent that they are very very expensive to kind of the memberships are very expensive. expensive. Okay. So the reason, Yani, it's much more easier to, for example, for a sister to, let's say, to walk in a park or to, I don't know, to just uh, do some form sort of exercise in the public rather than joining the gym, having the gym membership because they're really expensive. So that's 
So, yani, what is, yani, the loose clothing is one. For example, can they bicycle in loose clothing? Can they? Bicycle. Cycle. Okay. Cycle, yeah. I mean, I think it's very much to do with can they maintain their covering while they're in that situation, right? So is it possible to maintain the covering and maintain a person's modesty without showing parts of the body any in those situations? If it's possible, then it could be possible, you know? The, there were women at the time of the Prophet I'm sure who rode on horses and camels, right? Uh, but you had to maintain you maintain your clothing, you maintain your, uh, you know, the looseness of the clothing, etc. If you can do that, then fine. But I think the default needs to be that we need to create spaces, even if it's outdoor spaces, right, um, where women can have a bit of freedom, right? Um, apart from that, I would say that Alhamdulillah, nowadays, you know, uh, during lockdown, I think a lot of people realized that there's so much you can do even within your own home, you know. If you really want to exercise, there are so many videos, there are so many uh, people online that will teach you how to exercise yeah, even in your own living room, right? So. So we should take the better approach, you know, if, if we have some doubt that we'll be able to maintain our modesty, then we can exercise in our own homes, inshallah. Uh, otherwise, I think it is a community responsibility for us to create facilities and places where this is possible uh, and affordable for people, inshallah. And what about Burkini, for example, the Burkini? Normally, is it allowed to wear them in front of a female uh, young sisters? Uh, for Sorry, example, I, sorry I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Could you please uh, say it's like the burkini? The burkini, is it allowed for the, for the swimming costume, the burkinis? Is it allowed to wear in front of non mahrams and sisters? You know, personally, I've never seen a burkini that is actually that covering, you know. Um, so like i've i've got a burkini myself and you know the only place where i would wear something like that is on a women's only beach or something like this you know or women's only swimming facilities because the way that the burkinis are they're very clingy you know they cling on to the body so if you go into the water and you can't come out the the type of material it's made of it would be very tight and it would show a woman's shape etc so i'm afraid i don't consider it okay for that to be worn in front of uh you know non mahram men okay uh, long question next one you can read it on the screen now Okay, assalamu alaikum. May Allah bless you for all the benefits of sharing this in this event. What do you say about all non hijabis try to discourage and dissuade other women who strive to wear the hijab by arguing that it's not what you wear that matters but what's in your heart and your general conduct? They argue, for example, that a prostitute could be a hijabi all she wants, but that doesn't make her any more pious than a non hijabi whose general character is perceived to be better. Okay. Well, this is a uh, this is a logical this is fallacious logic, you know, it's incorrect logic. Uh, the point is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, our Creator, has commanded us to do something, so we should do it. We should do it, and in not doing it, is our own loss. Is our we are sinning, okay, and we are liable to be punished by Allah. Um, so, I've heard these kind of arguments, you know, subhanAllah, my sisters and brothers, what do you think it was like, what do you think it was like in the UK, in London, in the 1980s, and the 1970s, when my parents came here, you would never see a hijabi. All of the Pakistanis, Indians, 
you know, Muslims from all over the world in London, but nobody wanted to look like a Muslim, right? That's what it was like in the UK. And slowly but surely, you'll see that, alhamdulillah, the next generation, the generation who were brought up in the UK, who were born in the UK and brought up in the UK and in the West, they rediscovered their deen, they read the Quran, mm -hmm. they understood the message of Islam, and they came back to Islam, and they decided to wear the hijab, to obey Allah, to not be afraid to pray in public, and to be a Muslim in public, right? The reason why we have these fears, the reason why we say things like, oh, the hijab is backward, or there's no need, and is because we have a colonized mindset. We have a colonized mindset. You remember that the Westerners, the British, the, the white people, right, basically from the West, they came and colonized Muslim countries, right? And one of the things that they would do is they would treat the people who were less religious, the people who were willing to let go of the hijab, people who were willing to let go of deen, they used to treat them better and consider them to be of a higher status than the people who adhered to the deen and, the whole, and held strong to the deen, right? And this mindset of sense of superiority, right, has continued to stay with us in our communities, you know? SubhanAllah, you can see, you know, there's a, there's a, a historian called Franz Fanon. He wrote about how the French, how they uh, conducted their policy in Algeria. Okay, and this is what he says. He says the French colonizers in Algeria, and by the way, this is what European countries did in all the different Muslim countries, even in India, mm -hmm. right? Pakistan, yeah. which was India, right? The Muslims in uh, India also had to go through this type of thing, but especially in Algeria, it was very, very uh, obvious. I'll read what he said. He said that the Algerian policy or well, sorry, the French policy in Algeria was, they said, if we want to destroy the structure of Algerian society, its capacity for resistance, we must first of all conquer the women. We must find them behind the veil where they hide themselves. And in the And so they actually created Created campaigns where they try to convince Muslims to be more westernized, to be more like European women. And those families who listened to them, those families who became more westernized and more Europeanized, they were rewarded. They were rewarded with status, they were rewarded with positions in government and things like that, right? So this colonized mindset has stayed with us until today, right? We, we respect somebody if they go and study in the West, right? If they study in yeah. the East, we look down on it. Why? Why don't we read what Iqbal said? You know, subhanAllah, I was reading and, you know, try, I'm, I'm from the East. I only, I'm from the East originally, but I'm actually from the West. I, I just speak Urdu in a very basic kind of way, right? Then my parents taught me, but even I feel so inspired when I read the poetry of Iqbal, where he constantly saying to people, stop being impressed by the West. Stop being impressed by the West. The West looks good on the outside, right? It's very shiny on the outside. But believe me, when you grow up in these countries, you realize that there is a lot, there, is, there are a lot of social problems. There are a lot of social ills, right? And just because of the technology, just because of the outward image of the West, you know, sometimes people in Muslim countries get dazzled by it. But believe me, you know, I grew up with girls who, from the West, girls who are pressured, who are pressured into having sexual relationships from a very young age. You know, they have a problem here of teenage pregnancies where girls are, becoming pregnant outside of marriage. And then there's all these unwanted children, unwanted babies. And then men who will not look after the, 
their children and then single mothers having to look after, bring up children. And, you know, there's all sorts of problems in the West due to, due to the Western lifestyle and due to their lack of adherence to uh, the moral principles, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. So, my dear brothers and sisters, don't look down on the guidance of Allah. Don't look down on the guidance, the, the gift that Allah gave you. You know, our mm. success will come when we come back to the deen. Uh, it will not come from any other place. I, I'll repeat the same the saying of Umar. You know, we are we are a people. Allah gave us izza. He gave us izza through Islam. If we try to have izza from any other place, we will be humiliated. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so now just basically you can see another question on the screen now, inshallah. Yeah, so we have this question. We'll just quickly, inshallah, tell us three, four questions remaining, inshallah. If a girl started doing shari barda, I think that's what it says, by her choice, but because of her, the relative's pressure, she has to leave, she has left it, and she be punished for it. Look, um, of course, a person should do their best, right? We must obey Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's no obedience to the creation through, by disobeying Allah. We don't do that, right? We don't disobey Allah in order to please the creation. However, if a person is coerced, if they're forced, then, you know, and they, they don't have a way out, then, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in the person's heart, right? Allah knows that that person is doing it out of, wants to obey him. Right? But I would like to strengthen my brothers and sisters in the East. And I would like to tell you about the new Muslims. You know, subhanAllah, in the West, we have converts to Islam, right? Sisters and brothers who convert to Islam, whose parents get very upset sometimes, you know, that they became Muslim. Sometimes these brothers and sisters pray in private, in secret. You know, I remember one sister telling me that she, she was, her mother used to get so upset with her becoming a Muslim that she used to go to the, she, the only place she could pray was in the, in the bathroom, you know, subhanAllah. Uh, so let us keep in perspective, you know, the struggle. Initially there is struggle. Many brothers and sisters, even here in the West, you know, when they first started practicing, when they first started wanting to be religious, uh, praying even, their parents, even though their parents were from Muslim countries sometimes, because their parents were not practicing Muslims or not particularly knowledgeable or not particularly religious, they would say to them, what are you doing? You're becoming too religious, right? But over time, those, uh, those young people, they, they kept practicing their deen, they treated their parents with a lot of respect. And over time, subhanAllah, you see how the parents became religious afterwards, you know, because of their children, because of their children. So I think being on the path of truth takes patience, it takes perseverance. You know, don't give up, keep believing, keep trying and working on people. And you'll see that, inshallah, through your efforts. The rest of your family will also become come back to the deen, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for everyone. Amen. What is to be covered when a Muslim woman is to make salah? Can you please elaborate? So, okay. Um, so everything except the face and hands. Okay, and some of the scholars said the feet. Can also be uncovered, okay, the feet below the ankles. But yeah. the safer opinion, you read from what from what I've read, and when, when you read the fatawa, the safer opinion is to cover everything except the face and hands for the salah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in the Muslim wedding culture, specifically, women wear very short skin tight low necks and sleeveless attire in front of other women yeah to what extent is this allowed look i think when it comes to being in front of other women it's fine you know 
I think sometimes uh, I've been to weddings, like Arab weddings, and I've been to, obviously, I've been to Asian weddings, uh, Pakistani, Indian weddings. And the culture in India and Pakistan tends to be not to uncover, like, you know, not to wear very tight clothing from, from what I've seen, and not to uncover certain parts of the body, etc. But actually, in front of other women, there's nothing wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong with, for example, having a plunging neckline. There's nothing really wrong with that. You know, I don't think we should be too strict when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to the halal, right? Sometimes we might have some cultural sens sensibilities, right, that make us feel that that's a bit strange, right? So, for example, showing the shoulders, that's not very culturally for Asians. That's not the norm. Uh, it might have changed, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, usually it's not the norm. But in an Arab wedding, for example, it's quite normal for women to show their shoulders, right? Um, so, and also to show their legs. So I would say that there's nothing wrong with that as long as the aura between, so the aura for women with other women is between the navel and the knee, right? Or at least what would, they would normally cover in front of a mahram, right? So I would say that the rules are a bit more relaxed. I don't think we should be too harsh. You know, fashion keeps changing. And uh, as long as the aura is covered and as long as no desires are being incited, right? Uh, even in women's settings, then inshallah, it's okay. You know, um, just like, for example, uh, even dancing, right? In Asian weddings, usually in religious families, you would hardly ever see dancing. But in Arab weddings, you know, even sometimes the weddings of the families of the shuyukh, right? If you go to their weddings, dancing is normal. As long as it's like women only, they would dance. And maybe the Asians or the Indians and Pakistanis will look at them and think that's a little bit immodest, you know? But actually, no, it's not immodest. Yeah. It's within the guidelines. It's just that we have different cultures sometimes, you know. Um, and sometimes we can be too strict about some things um, when actually we don't need to be. We don't need to be. So inshallah, with, within the halal boundaries, we should, we should allow our daughters and we should enjoy that setting. We shouldn't be overly strict, you know. I remember my mom was telling me that when they were young, they used to consider makeup to be very something shameful, you know, in religious families. But actually, there's nothing wrong with makeup. It's something, it's okay, you know, as long as it's um, in the halal setting, right? So I think we should put more emphasis on uh, doing things in the halal way and not be overly zealous and overly strict about the things that actually are allowed, inshallah. Mm. Okay. Uh, is wearing a hijab in career choices? Well, look, all human beings have to make choices uh, conducive to their lifestyles, their values, right? So, as Muslims, we're no different, right? Um, my husband, he's very careful about where he gets a job because he doesn't want to deal with riba, for example, right? He doesn't want to deal with interest transactions. In fact, and sometimes he's even given up a job because of that, right? So being a Muslim, forget about the hijab, yani being a Muslim means you have to be careful in every area of life, yeah? You be careful in every area of life to obey Allah because your risk, your money, your wealth, your provision is from Allah. So in order to get that provision, you don't disobey Allah, right? So I think, you know, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, in the West, definitely, uh, and I'm sure in many other countries, um, Muslim women, Muslim men are very much a part of the economy, very much, very active, very uh, productive members of society in all different professions, in all different areas. Um, 
of course there might be some some professions that they would avoid because they're not conducive to their values and that's natural for all human beings you know all human beings make that decision so i think you can just look on linkedin you know a website like linkedin you see so many sisters subhanallah of all different uh job backgrounds all different levels of education excellently you know contributing uh, to society, uh, even sisters who are mothers, you know, there are so many different ways to contribute to society. And, but our number one concern, dear brothers and sisters, is not just this life, right? It's not just about this life. This life is mm. just a few days. This life is just a matter of a few days. And the real life is the life we're after. So we don't want to be highly successful in this life and then completely complete losers in the next life, right? We want, we want to gain Allah's pleasure in the next life, which is going to, going to be forever, right? And the true success. So we're here on this earth for a few days. We, we should spend this time in obedience to Allah. Spend that time in obedience to Allah. And that will bring us not only success in the next life, but in this life as well, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Ustaz Fatma. Uh, it's really a pleasure having you, you know, to be honored, inshallah, to have you for the first time on this live feed, inshallah. And we are hoping this not to be the last. And as, alhamdulillah, I think, uh, you know, as the COVID-19 situation changes, inshallah, then we are also looking forward to, to for you to come to Pakistan, inshallah. You know, because that is something we might be back on, inshallah, as we discuss, inshallah. So, yeah, so that would be something which would be wonderful. Uh, and I would love to. I would love to come to Pakistan. Yeah, that would be lovely. Yeah. So, and also on top of that, the back law said was for the audience, you know, for asking us some really important questions, inshallah. Uh, now, inshallah, so we are not going to be having any show on Sunday, which is the 3rd of August, I think. Uh, which is because of the Eid holidays, inshallah. So we'll rebroadcast the same show for today also on Sunday, inshallah. This, this is number one. The second thing is that, inshallah, we're going to be having on the 10th of August, there's going to be another, inshallah, remarkable show for the entrepreneurs now. So we are kind of shifting our focus to the Muslim male and female entrepreneurs for the next week and day of month, inshallah. And we are going to be having three to four shows, inshallah, showing you the various kind of areas brothers and sisters can actually go in specific to the youth, uh, you know, whether they are kind of uh, skill studying or they are into some other career choices, etc. So, inshallah, we are coming to you with a remarkable panel and you'll be receiving the updates for that. So, stay tuned, inshallah, for that. The 10th of August, same time, Sunday, 8 p.m. You might change the time slightly, but inshallah, it will be on Sunday the 10th. So, it's not, oh, Sunday the 9th, rather, inshallah. So Jazakallah khair once again to everyone. Um, and we call it today, Ustazah, Sister Sumaya, Jazakallah khair. I think it's time for you uh, for Fajr now, make in Australia. So, yeah, inshallah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so Inshallah, you know, uh, Jazakallah khair for, 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 for doing this uh, for today, Alhamdulillah. So Inshallah, Subhanakallah, Allah, Rabbi Hamdika. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.